Two recent uh, personal events launched me on the topic that I'm going to address today. A couple of weeks ago, I attended a presentation made by a couple of ex-Navy SEALs. And a couple of weeks before that, I was leading a work meeting and discussed a specific aspect of my current project. And statements made during, that, during those meetings uh, got me to thinking. The work meeting was just with a few folks. It was uh, not, a, not a, like a formal presentation, but just an intimate meeting. Our electrical superintendent was being moved off to another project. A new guy was coming in. There was a, an aspect of the scope of work that uh, lacked clarity, and there was confusion on it, and wanted to take the opportunity to, to not only address that issue, but also help uh, the new electrical superintendent uh, get up to speed. Like most folks in leadership position, both Andy, Andy is the outgoing electrical superintendent, and I are a little passionate about the, our work, and we're confident in our abilities and knowledge. And during a point, uh, not necessarily a disagreement, but uh, maybe we weren't expressing, we were probably in violent agreement. Sometimes that happens. But anyway, we were having a, a little bit of a, a tense moment there, it, and um, Andy said, you always think you're the smartest person in the room. And uh, due to my overconfidence and feeling like I was under attack, I responded with something, well, probably I am. <laughs> I'd like to think that I wasn't being serious. <laughs> but that was the reaction I had. Now, that wasn't the first time that Andy and I got a little cross, we got crosswired. He's the electrical superintendent. We sometimes get crosswired. Anyway, um, we, sometimes we, we've kind of gotten crosswise with one another. And like the other times, Andy and I laughed about it later. Uh, I gave him a hug, uh, and we made up. Uh, but his words gave me pause. Now, during the presentation by the Navy SEALs, which was primarily a loud, in-your-face, five-hour sermon about taking extreme ownership. And they proclaimed that the most important characteristic of a good leader was humility. The SEALs said that the key to success was the ability to check your ego. Those who can't check their ego, they can't listen to anyone. They can't evolve and get better. They can't adapt to new technologies and methods. They don't respect the competition. They get complacent. They can't self-assess. And they never ask, what can I do better? Pride is the opposite of humility. Thinking of yourself more highly than you ought is pride. Am I a humble person? Or am I one of those who can't check my ego? What is it to be humble? What does a humble person look like? So my purpose today is to review uh, the definitions of uh, humble, what the Bible describes as being humble, and what does a humble person look like? All right, so uh, definitions of humble. Uh, humble, uh, or humility as a noun, is defined as freedom from pride or arrogance. Freedom from pride or arrogance. Synonyms are, is demureness, down-to-earthness, humbleness, lowliness, meekness, modesty. Antonyms are arrogance, Conceit, egotism, haughtiness, loftiness, pride, and superiority. I actually found the article on Wikipedia very interesting and, and uh, thought-provoking, and I thought it was uh, some good uh, material. So this is from Wikipedia. Humility is an outward expression of an appropriate inner or self-regard. 
the outward expression of that inner self-regard. Humility may be misappropriated as the ability to suffer humiliation. Those self-denouncements, which in itself remains uh, which in itself remains focused on self rather than low self-focus. So, you know, sometimes we can talk in terms of kind of putting ourselves down, so to speak, but that's actually, it certainly can be, still, still self-centered. Humility, in various interpretations, is widely seen as a virtue which centers on low self-preoccupation, self-preoccupation, or the unwillingness to put oneself forward. So one of the things that I recognized in my own behavior at work was that my statements such as, I'm not the expert, or you guys know better than I, or I'm the idiot in the room, concerning construction practices may have, in fact, been expressions of false humility. That was a rather humbling observation. Because it's not my first rodeo, but I am on the engineering side. So I am the only engineering person on my for my company that's attached to our construction project. So I tend to not want to come across like I know more about construction than they do, because I know that I don't. I know that. But it's not my first job to follow through all the way through construction. So, but my statements, when I read that definition in Wikipedia, made me stop and think. How am I projecting myself? Am I coming, am I expressing humility? Or, because Andy's words were not without merit. He didn't say that because he didn't feel it. I mean, he, he thought that. And we actually talked about it. I'll, I'll mention that later. Okay, so that's, those are definitions of, of humble. Now, in the Bible, the word humble, uh, there's nine or, or so uh, Hebrew words. I was bouncing between the New King James and the King James Version, so I may have lost count on the exact wording. But anyway, I was putting down the words uh, that are translated or, or uh, yeah, translated as humble. There's nine different he Hebrew words and two different Greek words that are translated humble. Uh, of course, uh, these various Hebrew and Greek words are also translated in lots of other ways, lots of other English words. But when I pulled them all together, and there's a bunch, there's a bunch in the Bible about being humble. Try to pull them all together and try to coalesce it into, all right, what, what is the scripture telling us about being humble? So I came up with three primary senses, okay, three primary senses. So the first sense of the use of the word uh, humble is uh, the sense of afflicting ourselves, uh, correcting ourselves before God. So scriptures regarding a proper perspective or of, of our relative position in relation to the creator God. So sometimes we have to self-assess and get our mind in the right frame and humble ourselves so that, that's the sense of many scriptures, self-correction, the afflicting of ourselves in that manner. The second sense is being meek, modest, or being lowly in our own sight. So these scriptures, the sense of them is when we're operating in that proper position in relation to the Creator God. We're practicing righteousness. So we have many scriptures that talk about the reality of being humble. Moses was meek. He operated in righteousness. He yielded to God. And that is a sense of many scriptures that talk about being humble. And then the third sense is about being brought down low, of 
being um, subdued, about being brought under subjection. So when, whether it's uh, men or God, bringing people down under subjection, causing them to be humbled in that way. That's another sense of being forced into a proper relative position by the Creator God. So we see many different scriptures that talk about the, the proud, the arrogant, and the wicked, and how they will be brought down. So we have that sense. What does a humble person look like? What does humility look like? How do we describe it? Let's go to uh, Psalms 25. Psalm 25, and I think that I'm going to read the entire chapter. Because there's a lot, of, a lot of nuggets, as Mr. Buchanan mentioned in the opening prayer, that we can glean from this section, this psalm. So Psalm 25, starting in verse 1. To you, O Lord, I lift my soul. O my God, I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Indeed, let no one who waits on you be ashamed. Let those be ashamed who deal treacherously without cause. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. Remember, O Lord, your tender mercies and your loving kindnesses. For they are from old. Do not remember my sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to your mercy, remember me for your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he teaches sinners in the way. The humble he guides in justice, and the humble he teaches his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth to such as to such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquities, for, there, for it is great. Who is the man who fears the Lord? Him shall you teach in the way he chooses. He himself shall dwell in prosperity, and his descendants shall inherit the earth. The secrets of the Lord is with those who fear him, and he will show them the covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. Turn yourself to me and have mercy on me, for I am desolate and afflicted. The troubles of my heart are enlarged. Bring me out of my distress. Look at my afflictions and my pain and forgive all my sins. Consider my enemies, for they're many, and they hate me with cruel hatred. Keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I will trust in you. Let integrity and, right, and uprightness preserve me, for I wait for you. Redeem Israel, O God, out of their troubles. So a number of things that I'm going to look at or talk about, about being humble, are spoken about in this psalm. So the humble knows where he stands in relation to God. The proud don't even know how ridiculous they sound. It, if you looked at, if you drew on your piece of paper from top to bottom a scale and you put God on top and, and put where man is, I mean, try to get down on the very bottom of the paper, you know. And then if you drew little lines about where we are relative to one another, you know, it would take an electron microscope to figure it out. The humble recognize their position in relation to God. This psalm talks about that recognition, that need for instruction and guidance and help, the need for forgiveness, and recognizing that our God is our salvation in every way. The humble person says, 
You, you may think I'm ridiculous, but I'm going to follow the instructions of God. Our office out there, of course, they're all getting ready for Christmas. You probably can't notice that from this room either. <laughs> um, so uh, one of my workmates came up to me and she says, are you going to, are you going to follow uh, Amber's lead and, and decorate your door? And I said, no. What is wrong with you? And I said, I don't observe Christmas. Oh, I am so sorry. Because they all know I'm Jewish, right? <laughs> yeah, she said, so she says, well, you know, oh, you know, happy Hanukkah or whatever. I said, I'm, I said, <laughs> I'm not Jewish, but I don't participate in the celebration of Christmas. But it was just cute watching how, how horrified she was about that. But, um, but I mean, think about it. Um, I mean, we've probably all experienced where we felt like uh, we were under some attack. I remember this one time, this goes way back. Um, this uh, girl that I was working with, uh, she, she was asking me about clean and unclean meats. And we were talking about the, the verses there, the vision of Peter. Okay? And so I was... Um, I was trying to explain that to her, and I have no idea what my heart rate was, but it was elevated, right? You know, your ears are kind of getting red, and you're like, you're, and you don't even breathe. You know, she's like, take a breath, take a breath, you know. <laughs> Sometimes we can feel threatened, right? Kind of backed into a corner a little bit, and our response is, you know, the fight or flight is how it's typically rendered. But the humble, the truly humble person says, I don't, I don't care what you think about what I believe or what I do. I'm, I'm going to do what I believe God has instructed us to do. When compared in, to God in terms of power and authority and understanding and character, <laughs> the best of mankind is just a drop in the bucket or basically nothing on that scale. And when we compare ourselves among ourselves, which is a ridiculous thing to do, how can you make it out? So the humble person knows where they stand with God. They have a healthy appreciation of the power and authority of God. The humble seeks God in every aspect, wholeheartedly. What, what are we told that God looks for? I'll look for this person who trembles at my word. Sometimes you'll talk to, to, to young people as they've grown, they've grown up, and they'll say, man, hey, you know, how did, they, maybe they'll ask their, their parents, how did you get me to obey you? You know, I was semi-terrified, you know, to disobey. <laughs> how did you pull that off? Because I don't have that same feeling with my child, right? So that's how we should not feel terrified about our God, but to have that level of respect that if God says do it, we're terrified not to do it. That takes humility. It's the opposite of pride. So the humble seeks God wholeheartedly. The humble waits on God. We read that in that psalm. The humble waits on God to reconcile all things. Do we recognize that? That absolutely everything, every wrong that you've suffered is going to be reconciled. And I'll think about it in terms of like every little thing that happens, you know, that God's going to straighten it out. But in, in the end game, in the end game, nothing that can happen to us on this earth is not corrected by God. What can separate us from the love of God? Nothing. The humble waits on God to reconcile all things. He puts down the proud and elevates the humble. You know, the humble person recognizes that God is their salvation in every, in every sense of the way, in every sense of the word. So we read many different verses, you know, about how the wicked and the proud are going to be put down. 
God has no pleasure with the proud or the wicked. He protects and provides for and saves the humble. All right, so let's go to uh, Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3, and I'll read uh, verse 32 through 35, and I'm going to read this out of the Bible in basic English. For the wrong-hearted man is hated by the Lord, but he is a friend to the upright. The curse of the Lord is in the house of the evildoer, but his blessings are on the, on the tent of the upright. He makes sport of the men of pride, but he gives grace to to the gentle hearted. That verse, that last verse there is quoted by both James and Peter in the New Testament. We're going to read one of those. I thought it was, I liked how it was worded there. He makes sport of the men of pride. <laughs> the pride, you know, for us to be proud as men and women, in relation to our God, it's just foolishness. Make sport of the men of pride, but he gives grace to the gentle hearted. The wise, will have, uh, the wise will have glory for their heritage, but shame will be the reward of the foolish. So we know, we, we look forward to that reality that when our God returns to the earth and brings his kingdom to this earth and the resurrection of the saints and the ushering in of the kingdom and that the evil that we see in this world, the, the pride, the arrogance, is going to be dealt with. So let's go to uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. So 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 5 through 7. Likewise, you younger people, submit yourselves to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. That's one of the places where that verse in Proverbs is quoted. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time casting all your cares upon him for he cares for you so we can either learn to have a proper sense of our relative position in relation to the creator god through yielding to his instruction and our repentance or we will learn it the hard way by god putting us in our place Ultimately, those that refuse to yield to God because of their pride and arrogance will be put in their place in the lake of fire. And that's what we see throughout the scripture, that the proud and the arrogant will be brought down. So we have the opportunity to learn and grow today and learn of God's ways and through self-assessment, through instruction in righteousness, learn to have a proper sense of our place in relation to God, to humble ourselves in that way. All right? Next is uh, the humble asks himself or herself, How can I improve? How can I improve? You know, it's natural during the Passover season to examine ourselves, and we should be asking that question, and of course we should be always asking that question, how can I improve? So the humble person takes ownerships of their actions. Take ownership. In the psalm that we read at the beginning, he asked for forgiveness for his sins, his errors. I like how um, a lot of times, especially it seems like in basketball or volleyball, you know, the sports that we play, 
you know, you'll do something and, and, and you'll pop off with, my bad, my bad. You know, that's taking ownership of what you've done. Of course, it goes a lot deeper than sports, but the humble person doesn't push blame off on circumstances and environmental issues that are outside of their control. All of the sun got in my eye. Well, they said it. They said this, and they, they got my blood boiling, and that, you know, then I popped off. The humble person takes ownership of their words, their thoughts, and their actions. That's what we have to do with repentance, right? Take ownership. Hold yourself accountable. And it's not like, um, th this, is not, this is not holding yourself accountable when you say, well, look, I know that I'm not perfect, but, all right, so I know that we've all heard that phrase. We've probably all used that phrase or something very similar to it. That's not taking ownership. It's important that we take ownership of our own mistakes. And we go before our God, and we confess our sins, and we ask for forgiveness, and we move on. So take ownership. Don't blame other people. Don't blame your, your parents. Don't blame your family members. Don't blame your government. Don't blame society. I was thinking about how, you know, a lot of times people think in terms about, oh, you know, how important, of course, this is December 7th, you know, a significant date in our history, but just the importance of, of uh, defending our country, so to speak. And, you know, sometimes you'll hear a comment about, well, you know, if we hadn't done that, we would be speaking German. And the first thing, thought that comes to my mind is what, Jesus lived under Roman occupation. We went to the feast in Czechoslovakia in 1987, I think. There were six members there from East Germany that were there illegally. Our environment is not the line of demarcation between whether or not we will follow God's way or not. And we have many biblical examples of folks that suffered in a lot of different ways because of their refusal to yield to the pressures of life at that time. All right, so the humble person listens with the intent to learn. Listens with the intent to learn. If you've taken any of the Stephen Covey material or read the books or listened to it or gone through any of those seminars, this is, you know, seek first to understand and then to be understood. So the humble person listens with the intent to understand. A humble person lets the other person finish their thought or their point. The humble person respects the other's freedom to believe differently. So the humble person doesn't just hold their tongue and formulate in their mind their rebuttal until the other takes a breath so they can jump on in there. I know that we've all been involved in conversations like that, right? Can't wait for you to stop yakking so I can make my point. If you don't get in there quick enough, they've gone on to something else. And now, you're compelled to make the point anyway, even though they've moved on to a new topic. That's not humility. <laughs> That's not how a humble person responds. The humble person doesn't interrupt or abruptly change the topic. Think about this with political talk shows. I'll have to admit that I, I tend to, on the, way, on the way home from work, if I'm not listening to a book, I'll, I'll put it on uh, conservative talk radio because I can tolerate it just slightly more than I can tolerate NPR. But I don't know why anybody ever calls into some of those shows that has a difference of opinion. Because you are not going to finish a sentence. You won't. 
You'll, you'll, you'll start to try to make a point. They're going to walk all over the top of you. They will talk all over the top of you. They will ask you a nearly completely unrelated question and then badger you because you won't answer the question that they interrupted you with. It's like, why does anybody even call in to do that? Do they find pleasure in that? I don't, I don't find pleasure in listening to it. That's when I either just listen to, listen to the road noise or find, find something else. But that is so common, isn't it? It's so common. Now, sometimes we'll be sitting around in a social environment, and you're sitting around the dinner table, and there's like three conversations going on at the same time. Do you know what I mean about having a discussion with somebody, and, and maybe there's a little bit of difference of opinion, maybe they've got a different thought on, the, on a matter, and you can't wait. That's not humility. A humble person will listen. Wait. Try to understand and try to understand. Let's go to James chapter 1. James 1. James chapter 1, verse 19 and 20. So then... My beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear and slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Take a breath. Slow down. Listen to one another. Listen to what they're telling you, not only in their words, but in their body language. Try to understand where they're coming from before you jump in and make your significantly wise and obvious point. Be swift to hear, slow to speak. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 18. I'll just read it to you. Proverbs 18, verse 13. Proverbs 18, 13 says, He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. Other verses like that, you know, that, that caution us on making a snap judgment, making a snap decision before getting the facts. Part of getting the facts is listen. You have to listen and understand. I, we, the, um, this last Friday, we had another, no, it's Thursday, Thursday. We had an all-day session about safety, and it was all about being slow to attribute the accident to human error because a lot of times people jump to that you know why did that happen well you know the pilot made a mistake you know they should have done this should have done that and so the whole program is is based on stepping back taking a breath listen gather the facts come to understand what what was that you know the, the idea is that people generally do what they think is right at the time that they do it so you got to understand, what's the circumstances? What are all the factors that played into why people make the decisions that they make before you make a judgment? So it's important in showing humility to be patient enough to gather the facts, to listen to what people are saying. All right, a humble person is teachable. A humble person is teachable. So in that psalm, it talked about, teach me, guide me, help me. They're teachable, but they're also secure in their understanding. Able to listen to uh, another's understanding or belief or opinion with an open mind. They don't just shut down because it doesn't fit their paradigm. Cut them off. Don't let them finish their point. Just, this is how it is. Well, you know what? You're probably talking to somebody that believes just as strongly in their position as you do in yours. So it's important that we're teachable, but also secure in what we understand. A humble person is not afraid to get feedback, to solicit feedback. When Andy and I were discussing 
you know, the electrical superintendent, you know, af after our little meeting, and he came by my office, and we hugged and made up. He apologized. He, you know, he apologized for what he said. I mean, he said, that was wrong. I shouldn't, you know, I shouldn't have said that. I really apologize. And, and of course, I apologized as well. Um, but, I, but, I, but I talked to him. I said, listen, I know that you didn't say that. Now, I'm trying to think of how I actually would have said it, but I recognized that he wouldn't have said it if that's not how he felt. And that my actions, my words, my manner had caused him to feel that way. Now, after the analysis, I know that I was right, but <laughs> you know what I mean? So, you know, when we have an altercation like that, a humble person, you know, should be looking for how can I improve? What can I do better? And I apologized to him. I said, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry that that I came across that way. It certainly was not my intent, but obviously what I was doing caused him to feel that way. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs 1 and uh, verse 5, a wise man will hear and increase in learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. And be teachable. We've got to be able to listen. We've got to desire instruction, guidance, and help by those who are wise. Proverbs 10, 17. Proverbs 10, 17 says, he who keeps instruction is in the way of life. But he who refuses correction goes astray. You guys are here. <laughs> You're looking for instruction and guidance and help. And, you know, certainly in the opening prayer we heard it. Hopefully your prayers during the week. Ask the same kind of thing. I certainly do. Put your words in my mouth. You know what your children in Houston North need to hear. <laughs> Quite frankly, you know what I need to hear. Thank you for going on this journey with me as Richard discovers more about himself. But a humble person is not immature in understanding. Let's go to Acts chapter 17. So, see, to, to claim that you're the village idiot, to claim that, well, you know, I, I'm not the, you know, you guys are the smart ones, I'm just, you know, you guys need to show me, you know, that's false humility. That's false humility, okay? It's, it's not, a humble person can be an expert in many things. We should be experts in Christian living, Right? I'd hate to add up how many hours of instruction I've had. I ought to be an expert. All right, Acts chapter 17, verse 11. And this is about the Bereans. These were more fair-minded than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with all readiness. They had that open mind. They were ready for instruction. They had an open mind with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out if these things were so. They weren't quickly turned they weren't so shallow in their understanding, so insecure in their understanding that whatever, you know, some polished preacher comes up and yaks about gets them off going that way and then off this way. They're not unstable in that way. That's not humility. A humble person is able to be secure in what they understand, but be open-minded and be willing to search the scriptures to see if it's so. Sometimes people get a little bit concerned about any discussion about what is considered established truth. And my position is, is that truth will always stand. Truth will always stand. There's enough gray hairs in this room to know that the church has not always got it right. <laughs> and there's been tweaks along the way, right? I'm not looking for some big upset or something like that, but, but we're not afraid to reprove to reestablish what may be considered established truth. 
Because it's inevitable that we're going to hear different things from different people along the way. It's inevitable. So we should be secure, but with humility, receive it. Not get in their face about it. Not try to win them over to our opinion, which of course is right. But to search the scriptures to see if these things are so. All right, the humble, pe- the humble person doesn't seek to establish their dominance. A humble person doesn't seek to establish their dominance. They don't attempt to win every argument. A humble person is able to peacefully disengage without winning an argument. I am sure that you've experienced the opposite of that, right? Somebody that just can't let it go. Can't let it go. A humble person doesn't need to raise their voice and talk over the other to intimidate the other. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. All right, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23. And I'm going to read through 26. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all. Able to teach, patient. In humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God, perhaps, will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. A humble person doesn't have to win the argument. The truth wins the argument. God's truth wins the argument, whether they recognize it or not. If they do recognize it, it's not you that caused the recognition. If God, perhaps, will grant them repentance. We are servants in God's hands. We are tools in God's hands. God is the molder and shaper. He's the developer. At best, we can be a tool in his hand. So we may be called upon to show God's truth, but not quarrelsome, gentle to all, able to teach, patient, in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. It's not important to a humble person that others recognize that they are right. So a humble person is able to withdraw from an argument, even if the other party still thinks they're right. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 7. Proverbs 9, 7 says, He who corrects a scoffer gets shame for himself, and he who rebukes the wicked man only harms himself. Answer a fool according to his folly. Answer not a fool according to his folly, right? There's time and place for when we can actually have a discussion. You try to correct a scoffer, it's just going to turn on you. Uh, okay, hopefully you're still in First Timothy. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 3. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 3 through 5. If anyone teaches otherwise, he does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which, accord, which accords with godliness. He's proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed with disputes and with arguments over words, from which come envy, strife, reviling, and evil suspicions. Unless... 
use, uh, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, who su suppose that godliness is a means of gain. From such withdraw yourself. So a humble person is able to, in the face of an argumentative person, which being described in this way, to recognize when it's just time to withdraw. It's time to withdraw. It's God's work. The time will come. If, if they are in the wrong, if they are proud, if they are arrogant, they will be brought low. It is inevitable. Because God is not willing that any perish, but all come to repentance. So regardless of the timing, the time will come. And we've got to recognize, the humble recognizes when it's time to withdraw. Whether the argument is won or not, whether the point is made or not, whether it was heard or not, to just withdraw instead of just pouring gas on the fire. You know, Paul didn't worry too much about what others thought about him, right? Let's go to Galatians chapter 2. Different places, you know, Paul talked about how folks were making comparisons about different preachers, different apostles. Paul didn't seem to really care what other people thought. He was doing what God called him to do. So Galatians chapter 2 verse 6. But from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, it makes no difference to me. God shows personal favoritism to no man. For those he, who seemed to be somewhat added nothing to me. So he was talking about those that were bringing in you know, false doctrine. Claiming to be something. Paul didn't care what those folks thought about him. It wasn't important to him that he won that argument, so to speak. It makes no difference to me. So a humble person doesn't seek to establish their own supremacy or dominance. A humble person plays by the rules and plays to win. But he doesn't attempt to intimidate their opponent. Doesn't rub their nose in a loss. Let the final score tell the story. We live in a world that is filled with pride and arrogance. Rubbing your face in it. That's not what a humble person does. A humble person plays by the rules. They win, they win. If you win, you win. Titus chapter 3, verse 1. Titus chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. I'm going to read this from the um, English Standard Version. Well, actually, actually, it's from the New King James Version. There's a word in here that's from the uh, ESV. Titus 3, 1 says, Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility. And in the... Um, English Standard Version, it says, um, showing all courtesy, showing all courtesy to all men. So a humble person is also courteous. It's courteous, respectful to all. The way I like to describe this is that, that a humble person cleans up their own mess. Don't leave it for somebody else. You know, here in this church building, this is not our building. It's not our stuff. Some of the stuff is our stuff. For the most part, it's not our stuff. It's important how we take care of this. We're guests here, so to speak. I mean, we pay money to be here. But uh, this is not where we come to tear somebody else's stuff up. And if we make trash, clean it up. Be courteous to one another. Be respectful of one another. Don't leave, don't leave your mess to somebody else to clean up. That's humility. All right, so I'm going to start to meddle now. Um, a humble person accepts that their partner's difference of opinion on which route is better is okay. 
fact, maybe a humble person would be willing to ask, well, why do you like to go that way? Might learn something, might find out that it's a better way. Now, Sharon and I never have this kind of disagreement. I've heard that others do, but, um, <laughs> you know, I, because what I do when I get in the car, I say, which way do you want to go? <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> well, I like to go this way. Sharon likes to go certain ways because she'd rather have a light to make a left-hand turn. I drive a Miata. I'm not afraid to make that left-hand turn without a light. I respect her position on this, and that's okay. It's all right. Now, a humble per person doesn't stick to their own plans out of stubbornness. Well, I'm not going that way. Got a, a family member, won't mention any names. She argues with the GPS. <laughs> Turn right. Oh, I'm not going down that way. It's like, what? He's like, why do you even have this thing on? But sometimes we do that, don't we? Because we're human beings. It's like, I don't want to go down that way. I don't like going down Luetta. I like Eldridge. Even though in my back of my mind, I might be thinking, you know, well, Loetta may be a, different, a better route today, but I mean, since Sharon brought it up, I'm not going down Loetta. It's foolish, isn't it? It's just foolish. But sometimes we do that. All right, here's another one. A humble person lets their partner tell a story without correcting them all along the way. I saw some eyebrows come up with that one. <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm working on it. Isn't it funny how we're compelled to do that? Sometimes we'll be in a conversation, the story, I mean, the, the facts of the story really don't matter that much. But, you know, good night, we've got to be right. Why in the world do we feel compelled that we've got to correct our spouse when they're telling the story? I mean, unless it's just something outlandish. I mean, there's, a, there's a time for correction, but wouldn't life be a little bit more peaceful if we can just, like, just let it go? Is it really that important? No, 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 I'm sorry, it was blue. It was a blue car, it wasn't a red car, it was a blue car. What difference does it make? That takes humility to be able to take a breath and let it go. All right, uh, a humble person allows God to take care of things. You know, sometimes we'll, we'll hear it that they wait on God. We read that in that first psalm, waiting on God. A humble person waits from God to take care of things. I mentioned about Paul, you know, just not, Paul didn't seem to be intimidated or worried about somebody else taking over. Wasn't worried about it. Wasn't worried about his position in that way. But, you know, this is all God's work. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, you know, he talks about, you know, um, you know, one person says, I'm of Paul. The other one says, I'm of Apollos. You know, you, you guys are just being carnally minded when you talk that way. He said, look, Apollos water, I gave, you know, I planted Apollos water. God gave the increase. It's not my work, Paul said. I'm just a tool in God's hands. He wasn't intimidated. He wasn't afraid. He was humble in that way. But sure, Right? Let's go to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. We're going to read 16 through 21. Romans chapter 12, verse 16. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it's possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. Take a breath. Take a breath. For it's written, vengeance is mine. I will repay. The important matters. <laughs> the important matters, God is going to reconcile. It'll all work out. 
Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. For in doing so, you'll heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It takes humility to not want to, well, get vengeance. A humble person doesn't need to give everyone their resume. You may have had a workmate. I've had a workmate. It seems like every time, he, you know, when they first come in, it's like every conversation they have with everybody, they're giving their resume. It's like, okay, well, you got hired to do this job. I trust that you're qualified. You don't have to give me your high school records. <laughs> you don't have to bang your West Point ring on the table. Had that happen while somebody was expressing to me what their qualifications were. A humble person doesn't need to give everybody their resume. They're comfortable with allowing others to make their judgments based solely on the observations of their doings. You let your actions speak for yourself for themselves. Let's go to uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. First Peter chapter 3 and I'll read verse 1 through 4. That's talking about wives, but, uh, you know, men and women alike, we're all, we're all subject to uh, the sense of what Peter is talking about here. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Wives, likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without the word may be won by the conduct of their wives, when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear and respect. Don't let it be the adornment of merely outward appearing, the hair and wearing gold and putting on fine things. Don't be shallow in that way, but rather let it be the hidden person of the heart. With the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, all of us should strive to match up to these things, to think about these things, to Analyze to do self-assessment, to look at ourselves and say, how am I doing with that? Am I willing to allow my conduct, my words, my actions speak for themselves? I learned that at work, some of my words and my actions gave a message that I did not intend. It certainly was not a, a show of humility. But don't let it be the outward appearance, but the hidden person of the heart. And that's very precious in God's sight. Because God sees. He knows our ways. He knows our doings. He knows our thoughts. He knows our words. I'm not going to fool that. I might fool each other, but we're not going to fool God. But let our actions and our words speak for themselves. A serious disciple of Christ is in a continual state of self-assessment, self-evaluation, asking the question... What can I do better? A serious child of God looks into the mirror every day and says, I'm not who I once was. And I will be better than the person I was yesterday. In general, the scriptures give us you know, three different senses about humility. A proper perspective of our relative uh, position in relation to our God. Operating in that proper position by practicing righteousness that's humility understanding that if we don't come to that position through repentance god will force us there that is inevitable so we should be thinking we should be walking throughout uh, each day with a quiet confidence in our position as a child of god Secure in our understanding of how God would have us be. The culture of his family. Not condemning or doing battle with the folks in this world today who are they're still in darkness, they're still blind, they're still under the power of Satan, but patiently waiting for the day of God's battle when the revealing of his sons and daughters. The proud and all that do wickedly will be brought down. Not by us, but by God. The humble will be elevated by God. 
the meek will inherit the earth. So what does a humble person look like? Well, they're teachable. They take responsibility for their actions. They ask, you know, what can I do better? They listen with respect. They're courteous to one another. They don't go around trying to establish their dominance, but they're quietly confident in what they understand and who and what they are. They're willing to be viewed as odd, foolish, and unsophisticated by this world today, knowing that in due time, they will be raised up. Humility is a key to our success as disciples of Christ and as a child of God. One last scripture, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 6. First Peter chapter 5, verse 6 and verse 7. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your cares upon him, for he does care for you.